there, there are a couple of slides here, and I'm, we bring these because these are local. This is from our Dane County Youth Assessment, and so it happened here in Dane County. It includes some of the uh, suburban schools. So, um, and you, I'll just do, this is the high school data. The next slide will be middle school data. And, and this what, is MMSD, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. But this, what, this, no, this, it shouldn't say, it shouldn't say MMSD. It should say, this is Dane County Youth. So it's not oh. just MMSD, oh. it's all Dane County Schools, okay? Sorry, no, wait, that doesn't no, work, so. I don't need to change it right now, so just, shoot. It's okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I grabbed the wrong mouse, sorry. It's okay. Um, so what Whoa. you have in the top of the I feel oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Along the top are different like categories of students. Special education, the students who are enrolled in special education, you know what that is. Students of color, LGBT students, free and reduced lunch. Uh, and the next slide will uh, pulls out uh, transgender students. You'll see that uh, too. <coughs> FR. L is free reduced, and then that compares it to all MET. All MMSD or all county. Um, sorry, I typed that in, that's not accurate. And what you see along the left here are uh, risk factors or strengthening factors. So the top one is grades, at least 3.5, is one of those protective factors. We know that if kids have strong grade point averages, they're less likely to have different kinds of problems like attendance, grades, emotional issues. So that's a, the top one's a protective factor. The third one down, connected to school, that's another protective factor. So you want to see those numbers high. That means that they feel like they belong and are cared about in their school community. The last one that's a protective factor is family dinners. It's really arbitrary, but statistically, if you have dinner three or more times a week, it tends to be a protective factor for the, for the kid. And so these others are um, risk factors that you see have, have happened to the kids. So that they report being bullied more than one time a month, uh, alcohol use, marijuana use, prescription drug use, and depressed. And that was defined for the students who took this, this uh, measure as felt so sad, it felt sad or hopeless every single day for the last two weeks. So, um, We'll flip through this one and then do the next one. Is there anything? <laughs> yeah, Let's go ahead. Do people notice any like kind of disparities? Or well, that's what I'm going to have oh, you do. Sorry. Just go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll go to the second one. And this, this second one is just the same, only for middle school. And it will oh, shoot. That one doesn't have a transgender kid either. Dang. All right. Uh, you can use either one. Um, so it's the same things down the left and then um, across the top. So what I'd suggest you do, just uh, take a second, talk to somebody who's next to you, and kind of try to make sense of this. What do you see or what are you noticing? And I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. And we'll come back to you. Powerful. Um, what did you, what did you uh, come up with? What, what was part of, what was your understanding here? Yes. Anybody have some uh, things that they noted? Yeah. You know, the slide for the middle schoolers, like the rate of bullying for LGBT students for high school is higher, but for middle school students, it's like three times. And so it's just like the one. Wow. Yeah. What do you make of that? It's so, you know, like, I mean, we all can find that in the middle school's top, but that shows it. Yeah. Empirically. Empirically, right. Yeah. And, the, yeah. and that that's true nationwide. It's the highest. Of middle school. There's, there's, a, there's a pretty big difference too between the connection to school mm -hmm. between middle school and high school. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Oops, well, <laughs> like, is, is maturity helping with? Mm -hmm. So, like, more acceptance as they get older. Mm -hmm. That could be. That could be. <laughs> yeah. I also think about how high schools might have had to deal, like in Dane County, high schools in Dane County have had GSAs in them for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So there might be greater familiarity and more of a, oh, it's just part of the community. Um, and so at middle school, there's not very, like, although that's growing, um, this was in 2009, I think. So there was like maybe one or two middle schools in Dane County outside of Madison, even in Madison, there weren't a lot of middle school GSAs. So I suspect there's like, if, because GSAs, like, uh, 
the CDC as well as like the Department or the uh, U.S. Secretary of Education talk about how GSAs have a, a positive uh, benefit to the school community. And I think that might be not to say that GSAs are the end all be all, but there might be a difference there. So or at least familiar, familiarity with the issues. So. Yeah. It seems like despite the fact that the strengthening factors are pretty good for the LGBT yeah. community, they're, good. Yeah. they're still suffering, you know, yeah. alcohol yeah. use, and marijuana use, and depression significantly higher. Mm -hmm. So exactly. strengthening stuff is not equalizing. Absolutely, that's true. And one of the things that isn't on here, but is also true, that's very high, is the uh, actual uh, suicide attempts that were uh, required hospitalization is just off the charts on GLPT. So yeah, and I, and you know what? That was most brought up to me by a student who was a wonderful student from last year. I wonderful meaning real high achieving, did well. Everybody said, oh, everything's great for this this kid who's now in UW as a student as a freshman. And she came back and said, I want you to know how many issues there were in our group last year. She was very active at GSA. She said there were people who were doing, you know, self-cutting. There were there were lots of issues. We're supposed to be so all good, but I, yeah, people still are having a lot of issues just because of their yeah. Yeah. You meant, you, I'm sorry, you mentioned the transgender specific numbers. What do you remember of what are, what are on those there, charts? Unfortunately, and there's a new huge study out, it's a retrospective study, um, of, of, of like 5,000 transgender individuals looking back retrospectively, but there's a lot of new, very new data on this, yeah. but they were by far uh, more, had many higher risk factors, yeah. um, by far, yeah. I mean, it, by really by far. So those, those students were the most affected, most negative. Affected. And they were had higher rates of being disconnected from school. Okay. They didn't feel the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, don't that's okay. that right. yeah. I was wondering about the crossover in categories, like you would have LGBT students in the special ed, you'd have LGBT right. students in the students of color, yep. et cetera, you know, and there's no way to well, the overlap, that, that here, I, I don't have that. This time, this year, we're redoing it. I'm excited because it could be more sophisticated about how to drill down into some of that data. But um, we do know that anytime you layer color over any of these issues, it's much tougher. Much tougher. So and there's a whole thing on this this new uh, thing that's out. It's uh, the retrospective study on transgender individuals. And there's a whole piece on that that's about Latino. It's hard stuff, actually. Yeah. Well, just a question about the actual survey. Maybe I missed this, uh -huh. but what does FRL stand for? Free and reduced lunch. So that's an oh, income. Oh, okay. Motor. I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, so those are kids who are, are, are eligible to receive free and reduced lunch. And then what does the stars mean for the asterisk? Uh, there's, an ex uh, ex there, there's another sentence down there that oh, it is on the slide that explains just what I said. Okay. Thank you. I had to. I could only get so much on the slide before it became unreadable. So yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's all. So, so income too. So you know, mm -hmm. poverty, mm -hmm. color, uh, special <laughs> education status. Yeah. Cool. Did, yeah. You had your hand up earlier. Did you still have a question or? Uh, okay. I right, sure. All right. Good. Should that we... cheered everyone up. Right. Do you want to talk about this? Sure. All right. So that's what's happening. So and I'm, this I do want to go through quickly. So just. Um, again, just as a review for some folks that have been here before. Um, so some, some laws that um, um, provide protections for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender youth, um, as well as, I would say, um, youth of uh, LGBT parents. Um, so if we're looking at the, so if we're thinking about federal laws, we have the First Amendment. <coughs> the thing that's most important for me around the First Amendment is that it um, guarantees the students' right to be out at school and to be as out as they want to be. Um, and I was just doing a training with elementary educators for the like an all elementary group for the first time earlier this week. And the point that I made there also is that um, um, they get to be out about having gay parents um, and be out about as, as much as they want to be about having two moms or two dads or some combination. So, um, so the First Amendment protects that. We also have the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which says that if a school is going to protect one group of students, they have to protect all groups of students equally. Um, this came into play uh, back in the mid-90s with the Jamie Bosney case in Ashland, Wisconsin, if people are familiar with that. Um, basically, there was a student starting middle school on up to high school 
um, targeted with anti-LGBT harassment and bullying, um, first before he came out and then later after he came out as a young gay man. Um, and what was happening is that was happening, um, he'd take it to the school, like, and then individual administrators at the school at first would be like, you know, well, if you're gonna be gay, this is what you can expect. Uh, what do you want us to do about it? Um, as he got older, they'd be like, well, that's just boys being boys or kids boy being kids. Um, that's just what guys are gonna do. And they say that in response to, you know, getting uh, pushed down and um, pushed down into a urinal, urinal and urinated on, uh, being um, sexually touched uh, by classmates in the middle of the class. Um, one of the worst cases of harassment was when he was um, 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 attacked by a group of students in, uh, in the hallway and punched and kicked so hard that he went to the hospital later for internal bleeding. So, uh, what was happening? So, so going to administration, administration not really doing anything. Although, to be fair, I talked with educators from the Ashton School District who were there at the time. And there were educators trying to help out, and one either the administrators were working with them, or they actually pushed those teachers out of the school district um, for trying to protect that student. So anyway, what happened is finally Jamie and his family sued, um, and they sued on the basis of the equal protection or the, uh, the four, equal protection clause, Fourteenth Amendment, and. Um, Three, there was three individual administrators that collectively were, were held responsible for $900,000 in damages. And, and basically the court said, you have to protect gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender students in the same way that you have to protect other students. Um, so you can't just say it's boys being boys or kids being kids, or if you're going to be gay, this is what you can expect. So that was a very powerful um, court case. Yeah. When was that? Um, it was late 90s. I want to say it was like 96, yeah. 97. So um, the, the student's last name is um, Nabozny, N-O-B-O-Z-N-Y. Um, and it's also featured in the documentary of Bully that was put out by Teaching Tolerance this past year. So, uh, yep. Was it, what school district was trying to get rid of their GSA or trying to? Um, <laughs> West Bend. Was West, West Bend. Bend. So, yeah, so there's in southeastern Wisconsin there. Well, not to pick on southeastern Wisconsin, but sometimes I do. Uh, um, but there's yeah, some, yeah, yeah. So, so there's some communities in that area um, that um, actually it's around the state and around the country. Um, some school districts um, um, feel like they can say no to the GSA, and I'm going to actually talk about that. Um, the Equal Access Act, which is a law that says if you have one non-curricular club at your school, you have to allow all curricular clubs at your secondary school. So sometimes middle school is considered secondary, so that protection doesn't extend down to all middle schools. Um, but yeah, so sometimes schools would be like, oh, we can't have a GSA in our school, even though they've had it, and by law they're required to have it, uh, but then either the school board or administrator or a group of parents decide that they want it out of the school and still start a campaign. It makes life pretty miserable for the students and the educators. The other thing I was going to say for federal laws is Title IX, which basically says that you can't discriminate against a person because of their failure to conform to st uh, stereotypical views of masculinity and femininity. Um, so even though we don't have federal um, legal protections for um, people on the basis of gender identity um, and expression or for transgender people, um, Title IX, and I don't think there has been case law yet, um, not that I'm familiar with, um, um, with, but Title IX could be used as a protection or as a way to um, um, Influence some folks around creating protections for uh, transgender folks. <coughs> Thank you. So, um, I s uh, another question? So, yeah. I just have a question. I'm not like too knowledgeable on what school districts can do, but I mean, there's just a case like a few years back, like 2010, in Michelle Bachman's old region uh, in Minnesota, mm -hmm. where the school district said that. Yeah, you no could, problem, 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 yeah. So can't I talk mean. About it. I just don't understand how they legally can do that when we have these amendments. I mean, of course, people always do things that are not right, but you know how when these amendments are in place, and then they had like a very huge like suicide, like ten, I believe it was in that region because they went for yep. the no promo homo. Yep. Um, I don't have a perfect answer for you, except the community will. Okay. So they might not have the courage to stand up. So I think a lot of these efforts to squalls. Um, um, if taken to court, to, if able to get up to the highest level, would probably be shot down. Right. But that takes time, energy, and effort. Mm -hmm. So, um, and um, and yeah, this, uh, Minnesota actually has better protections for gay, lesbian, and bisexual, and transgender students than Wisconsin does. So, yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know how that continues to happen, but it does. It's like so. it, you could do it, but but if so, if you have to be taken to court. You know, it's yeah. probably would be found to be illegal. Although, the I, little bit I know about the equal access. Uh, act it hasn't always been supported, so it depends. It depends, and I think that case law hasn't happened. And it's it takes the exceptional student going all the way to the top, like Jamie Bosdy did, to really make it clear and to and to serve as a warning to school districts 
like, okay, go ahead, but you could get, you individually could have to pay a price for doing this. Yeah. So well, I think that's, that's the difference. Yeah. So, uh, and yeah, like with those, um, like, most, um, most of the time, if a high school that has other student clubs um, tries to stop a GSA, um, for instance, um, I don't think there's been a court case where the court has ruled in favor of the school that tried to get rid of the GSA, um, but you have to have the energy and the will and the ability to push that court case all the way off. So sometimes schools cave, like West Bend did. Finally, they caved, although now they're still trying to put restrictions on the GSA that they don't have. Um, Tell um, me they, did, they got rid of all their clubs or anything. Get rid of all their clubs? Like I, you know, I can't remember anymore. They didn't so. want to be pushed. They have to support GSA, so they right. just said, right. you know, people yep. have So clubs. one of the things that they, another strategy is to require students to get parental permission to be a part of student clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, that oh. feels pretty shady, too, um, particularly because, you know, most parents would be like, yes, chess club. But not all parents are going to be like, yes, GSA. So, and usually when schools introduce that, they introduce that after the fact of a GSA or when trying to squelch a GSA. So I think students could also push and say, this is discriminating against the GSA because you're only introducing this because there's a GSA present, but then you need the time, energy, and resources to be able to do that. So, so schools can get away with crap uh, because people don't always have the time, energy, or will, or don't feel safe challenging, especially if it's, a, if it's in a community where they don't feel good support. So, so that was federal laws. State laws. So uh, it's important to know that in the state of Wisconsin, and these are um, school-based laws. So um, we have the people non-discrimination law that basically says you can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. Wisconsin was the first in the country to provide that protection for students, but now we're behind because we don't also provide the same protections on the basis of gender identity and expression uh, because back in the 80s when this was passed, um, our, our, our knowledge and um, um, our awareness of um, the needs of transgender people either wasn't very evol uh, evolved or we were willfully ignoring it um, because the gay and the bisexual community doesn't always do a good job at the team. Um, but anyway, so... It is their advantage. What's that? It is a part yeah, of individual school districts can uh, amend. So if you're working in the Madison School District or if you're working um, with people in the uh, Middleton School District, um, both of those schools have amended their non-discrimination policy to include gender identity expression. Um, DPI has an administrative code that backs up the people non-discrimination law. To also say that um, harassment is considered uh, discrimination, because sometimes people say, well, harassment isn't discrimination. You know, if you're harassing somebody, that's not really discriminating against them. But the DPI code says no harassment is discrimination. Um, and then finally, we have um, back in 2000, the fall of 2010, all schools were required to have um, uh, anti-bullying law in place. Um, either one developed by the Department of Public Construction or individually as a district. And so that adds complexity, put both complexities as well as additional yeah. tools to use um, when advocating for a youth uh, or a young person in the school. So. And just to say a little bit about that, that the plus is that it's now clear we've been do doing training in Madison that teachers are legally responsible to step in. Okay? You have to step in. It's clear. If, and we have to train all staff to do that and how to do it where the forms are, what the definition is, all of that. So that's been very clear. The downside, and this was a new paper that came out recently, talked about how sometimes people just shove everything into the bullying category, like things that are, you know, very serious sexual assault yeah. <laughs> got put under bullying, which is, yeah, it's bullying and it's sexual assault. Yeah. So sometimes, I mean, I guess that's the caveat I would have, is that you have to be careful not to shove everything. Right. So just, it, just a little bullying. Well, to help uh, adults working with young people, or even young people recognize that um, some of the stuff that they do in school um, is considered bullying, but if it was out in the workplace or out in the street, it would actually be considered illegal or a crime. And so helping young people recognize that, you know, uh, or parents recognize that they're like, well, I don't care if my child's bullied or something like that. It's like, well, you know, this could get them fired out of the workplace or get them in trouble elsewhere or something like that. So helping recognizing that sometimes it's like, um, students get away with crimes um, under the, the label of bullying. So. Cool. Well, not cool. So yeah. um, I'm trying not to use that as a transition. I, my transition word is cool, and I think I have to say that after depressing stuff. So I did it after talking about um, suicide uh, at another <laughs> training. So somebody very nicely reminded me that I did that. I'm like, thank you. All right. So, um, so those are some laws. Then we also have professional responsibilities, you know, as social workers or as social work learners. Um, and usually I just ask the question, uh, where do you think uh, the minimum? So the, the Riddle Scale was developed by Dorothy Riddle in the 70s, measuring people's attitudes towards differences, particularly towards gay, lesbian, bisexual people. Probably wasn't thinking about transgender people at that time. Um, and so, um, so she measured from, um, 
identify propulsion to nurture it. So usually when I talk with educators, um, as far as what the minimum, um, what, the, what attitude they need to bring into the classroom, as far as towards people's differences, usually what I recommend based on professional expectations and standards is support. In other words, um, you're not just accepting or tolerating somebody's difference, but you see somebody's difference as something that needs to be supported. You need to work to create an inclusive environment. So usually that's what we were at with educators. Um, social workers and social work lawyers that I've worked with over the years would say that for social workers, it actually needs to be nurturance. So where it's like you're nurturing uh, that important piece of a person's um, identity um, in the way that you approach them and like and which of course takes time and if you're not there like you know be at support and work up but um, what I've heard from social workers and social work lawyers is that but people could disagree with me or like what, what, do, you is think? Yeah. what do you think is that where social workers need to be in terms of professional responsibility <laughs> um, I see that hand and then I see yeah. that hand I think it it seems to me like the support, admiration, appreciation, and nurturance should all kind of be one. Like, it should include all of those to be, as a social worker, because I think there's certain times that each one will become important. Yep, sure, yep. great. Yeah. I'm a, a professional counselor in the community, um, and our standards kind of talk about appreciation and nurturance um, as our core values as well, so pretty similar to social work. Similar. Yep. So we are a little bit different shoes from teachers, but, but uh, where they're nudging along. <laughs> so, uh, I wanted just to keep moving yeah. along. So, um, so a uh, former uh, student, uh, field student who from the part time program uh, worked with us um, the other year, she helped develop this slide for uh, social work learners. Um, so, she talked about, so similar to the middle scale, also a scale of cultural competence. Um, and, you know, recognizing that as social workers, like um, doing what you can to increase that social. Uh, or cultural competency when working with different groups. Um, what she, of course, then said is like, you know, you have down here cultural destructiveness all the way up to advanced cultural competence, and always striving for that advanced cultural competence, because um, that makes you more effective and it makes you better able to uh, work with those uh, different groups of folks. Um, Liz, you had me put this in this morning. Yeah, so, so this was from NASW. Uh, standards of practice, and I thought, you know, it makes you feel good about being a social worker. So it takes things from uh, the personal. I think the first one's a little bit more personal. It says that you work on behalf of vulnerable and oppressed groups and individuals. So that's that connection we have to individual students or groups or whatever, and that we're going to make sure that they get what they need and uh, provide services. The second part, I think, is the part that's exceptional about social work, and it, it says. Yeah, you could read, but to end domination and exploitation of uh, people, which is based on right, uh, the whole list of things here, um, in terms of different communities and differences. So I think it's really, um, you know, it, I love that for social workers, it's not enough. It really isn't enough for us just to work with those individual students. We have to be working on those systems of oppression because there's no point in just saving each of these, you know, working on individual. Don't you love that? Welcome to a great profession. <laughs> um, <coughs> all right, so we're moving into so so some things. So Liz and I, as we were thinking about this workshop, we wanted to do kind of an overview of some basic stuff that you need to know, and then uh, or like just some background information on LGBT folks, professional responsibilities. Then we want to move into what you need to know when working, but when starting to work with this uh, population if you haven't already started. Um, and so we're going to talk about that briefly, and then we're actually going to move on to um, actual steps and then look at some scenarios and stuff like that. So, so hopefully. we we'll got a lot to cram in this hour, but I think we can skip some of it. And yep, I think we can. Do. So we already talked about youth rights. One of the things that we're not experts on is uh, youth rights um, laws that protect um, LGBT in the community outside of school. I didn't know of anybody, like, based on, in addition to what we talked about school-wise, uh, both state and uh, federal, are there any other things that you think that, that you're aware of that um, would be good to raise up in this forum as far as just um, the rights of youth um, in the community? Any 
And the reality is, of course, youth jobs are to be at school, and so, uh, so their work is school, and so that's where they're often at, because that's usually where issues come up, so cool. Um, so we already talked uh, school responsibility, we're talking about the middle scale as well as state laws, state and federal laws, so we don't need to talk about that. Um, <coughs> talked about, um, a second. Um, so one of the things, I, I mentioned this earlier as far as what support looks like, um, and let's really talk about this first one, uh, if you're concerned, you don't want to talk about that. Sure. Uh, doesn't matter. I'll, I'll let you do it. Okay, Look so this is time. just, uh, it, it, it's a great, it's out of this National Medical Center, and it's a nice little handout that gives some guidance to parents who might be concerned about their uh, their child being uh, different, gender independent or gender fluid or whatever. So it's a great little handout. You can access it online. And I actually have, um, you should have gotten, um, it was one of the things I was handed out after you got here. If you got here early, it might have been up the table. There's a two-page document that the bottom it has, and I hand wrote in from the National Children's Medical Center. So it actually has the advice for parents of gender variant. The term they use is gender variant um, children. So that's something that you can take a look at. So, um, yeah. so does anybody have that in their handouts? So it's that one. Yeah, okay, people have it. Really good. So, so that's one resource that's been really helpful, particularly when you have working with parents whose children are gender variant, or maybe possibly transgender, or just very gender non conforming. And what I like about it is it's, it's very realistic, it's very practical. Um, it encourages parents to check themselves, as well as it's also working with the children to help recognize that how are you going to navigate some of the obstacles that you're going to encounter in life? So it's not pretending that they're, uh, right. that they're not going to encounter obstacles, because the reality if you're gender non-conforming, um, you're going to encounter pushback, and you're going to encounter people who don't support you or um, um, might want to treat you poorly. So. And there, you'll find on the resource sheet, the last resource sheet you have, too, that's local. It's listed. There's a great website that I use all the time. I'm just kind of defaulted to there, which is the Gender Spectrum website. Um, and it has all sorts of information that you can go to. It's great for questions parents ask, for educators. It's good quality information. And it's written by a person who wrote one of the books we're going to cite here in a minute, but The Transgender Child, which is kind of a, uh, a standard in terms of uh, good information. So I've already talked about the Family Acceptance Project um, earlier in the presentation, but that's another really great resource. So and we share these. Um, so when we talk about what support looks like, it's really helping families, um, just like if you're working with families or if you're working with the system, like really helping them start to identify what is accepting. And of course, I recognize that we just talked about the middle skill that says support to nurturance. Yeah. And so the language here is acceptance, but that's kind of really what people use to talk about their work. So um, recognize that people might use um, uh, uh, words differently, but what we're really trying to do is create a, an environment of support and um, um, nurturance for young people. So, um, so it might be a little bit of semantics um, here. But anyway, so family acceptance project. Liz, I'm, we're at an hour yeah. until the end, yeah. so I'm thinking, what do you think? Do we oh, it's such a good video. We have two different videos, and we'll probably only show one of the two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So which one? The hands. Oh, this is salty. Uh, okay, do you want to see the video on um, uh, family acceptance? It's about a, a Latino family and the journey from when the, the kid starts to come out as gay. And some people have already seen and it. And some so. people may have already seen it. Uh, or, or <laughs> the second one is about uh, youth in the juvenile justice system. Uh, yeah, LGBT youth in the yeah, juvenile justice, yeah, the juvenile justice system. system. Uh, so let's see, let's either put up one or two. One is the acceptance, two is juvenile justice. I see mostly two. Mostly two. two. Great. Okay. So, and and just, so, just so you know, if you go to, uh, if you look at Family Acceptance Project on YouTube, like you can watch either of these for free online. So it's not like if you don't see it today, you won't be able to see it. So okay, just, okay. just focus on and show how cool it's And it'll make people want to watch the video. Oh, well. Well, you, okay. you have to talk about this because okay. I know. Okay, oh yeah, I'll talk about this. This is uh, somebody from our the, the transparent group that I work with here in town, and it's a meets monthly fabulous group of parents that are here to support their students and understand more for themselves. Anyhow, this is one of the parents who's doing, <coughs> I just thought it was cute too, he's doing a, a rafting trip down the Colorado to raise money for a camp that accepts um, uh, transgender kids from all over the country for free and gets them there for free. And so he's doing a fundraiser 
for that. So feel free to donate. He's all made, he needs $475 as his goal, so could use the extra help. This group of parents is, I can't say enough, you would never, I feel so privileged to be among them in their monthly meetings. They are really doing a ton to support their kids. Um, and you know, so we, oh, we were going to hand out those things, uh, accepting non accepting. Accepting non accepting, should you? Should we do it? Yeah, well, <coughs> right. you can keep these anyhow. So, um, so Liz and I were brainstorming some examples of what uh, a kind of a range of um, responses to gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender youth, um, either from families or from organizations or from professionals. And so, and Liz, just so you know, there's, um, well, there might be enough for everybody. So the thought was like, it was, we share. <coughs> So, um, and the thought was, I'm just mindful of time because I think I do want to give people time to get into scenarios. So the thought is, so um, um, another handout uh, that we gave out earlier as you're coming in, it says supporting your GSA activists, and really that's just, I, I changed the title of that, and that's just one that I had to get deep. Um, but it's really about, um, it comes from the Family Acceptance Project, it's a front and back machine, again, it says supporting your GSA activists at the top. Um, but really what it is, is like just simply took out um, uh, examples of supporting behavior, supporting the, uh, examples of rejecting behavior. Um, and what our thought was with this was to, as you read the scenarios, like um, kind of look at that, kind of look at the scenarios that we just gave you, or the examples that we gave you, and talk about. Um, so what about this is accepting? What about this might be rejecting? How could you, if you were working with the family or working with the adults um, or the system, how could you encourage more accepting? Um, response, but I'm worried that we don't have enough time to do that and it's just about I, I agree. So what you want to look at on there, but the big piece of information <laughs> to know is that if the, if you have a family, the more you can build family acceptance, it seems to, it, it, that is a protective factor, a yep. huge protective factor. So whatever you can do to increase that family acceptance of that yep. youth, that's the most important thing you can do. Mm -hmm. That's one really important thing you can do. Yeah, so I, you want to help people move along that continuum of yeah, and sometimes, like I've heard some people use the information and let a family know who might not be as accepting. Might be like, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know if I would want to let this child be gay in my house or whatever else. I mean, um, you know, as somebody who sat through many legislative hearings and stuff like that, where I hear people vilify gay people and say, you know, they're sick, they're wrong, they have really dangerous lifestyle, that drugs, alcohol, sex, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What we know from the Family Acceptance Project, um, and what we kind of always just intuitively knew, but people don't believe face until it's been proven by. Uh, um, it's evidence-based or, or it's been proven by data. Um, it's not it's, it's not the being gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender is inherently has negative impacts. So what it is is about the community and the family around them. So it has an impact. So but I, but I haven't had a chance to tell family this yet. Um, but you know, letting the family know that if you choose um, to reject your child, you're increasing the likelihood of drugs, alcohol, high-risk behavior, high-risk sex and stuff like that, if you choose to support them, here's what support and acceptance looks like, you're actually going to increase their resiliency. So you have a choice as a parent whether you're going to reject your child or you're going to accept them. But no, if you reject your child, there's going to be some strong negative outcomes that isn't inherent to who your child is. It's about your behaviors as parents, which sounds really like mean and stuff like that, but sometimes you need to box somebody over the head. So anyway, <laughs> cool. <I'm> just <laughs> All right, so, um, so we talked about We've already talked about some local resources, um, um, which is in one of the handouts. We've talked about some state resources, um, which is one of your handouts has a, a thick packet of Wisconsin-specific uh, resources. Um, we also want to mention that the Department of Public Instruction, I forgot to add this link to the website. Or I think it's on one of the handouts. It's on one of the handouts, yeah. Uh, but the, the DPI, the Department of Public Instruction, has a web dedicated to LGBT resources for, LGBT, for people around LGBTQ youth. I can't speak anymore. Um, national, um, there's also a handout um, um, with, so we gave you a lot of handouts with resources. So recognize some are local, some are state, some are national. Um, you know, kind of as just cutting through it, if you're working with a student who's suicidal or thinking about suicide, recognize that the Trevor Project is a national 24-hour hotline slash um, online chat for youth who are considering suicide. So that's usually one of the things that people want to know where you send people. Um, I do also want to say that we've all heard of the It Gets Better Project. I'm sure many of us have heard of the It Gets Better Project, um, where the message is, hey, if you just hang out, like when you're an LGBT adult, it would be great. Recognize that if you're thinking about developmentally appropriate messages, telling a seventh, grade, seventh grader who's getting bullied uh, for being transgender 
uh, that, hey, you know what, it's going to get better. Uh, that's very developmentally inappropriate. Yes. So you need to let them know, it's like, you know what, it might get better, but let's work together to try to figure out how to make it better. Um, and to also recognize that, you know, the whole project, the Dan Savage project, <coughs> there's a lot of class privilege, there's a lot of race privilege, there's a lot of male privilege um, in his message. It's a great project and there's been lots of positive things that have come for it, but just be really thoughtful um, to not just reiterate the whole it gets better message because um, for some people that's not true and for other people it might be true um, in six, six years and if you're a sixth grader or a seventh grader waiting six years for it to get better, that's hard. So anyway. Uh, some youth have, have reclaimed that project. There's a new, there's one on, that's called the Make It Better Project and it was youth saying yep. we're not going to sit around and wait, we're going to make it better and there's some wonderful <laughs> yeah. Oh, so we're lucky here in Madison. We have what's called the Cooperative Children's Book Center with some great people. Um, just to say, one of the things they do is they help uh, protect people for putting books in the library that need to be in the library to support students. And so, if you're in an outlying area or whatever, they uh, they can help anybody who's threatened by people calling up and saying, "I don't think you should have this book on your shelf." But they also provide an incredible array, and we, uh, I have a book list if you're interested, of books that are uh, appropriate. And there's lots coming out, especially in that sort of middle school to high school area. They're really nice books. And we've used them a lot of ways. Sometimes we use it, you were saying about restorative practices, so that kids can, maybe if they've done something that really was harmful, they can read a book, talk about it, and learn something about changing their behavior. So that's their. Um, and then the rainbow list, this is um, a, a woman in our school district who's an art teacher decided she's a parent of a transgender uh, child and wanted to, uh, there to be materials. So she wrote a grant and got it. Yes. So, uh, did, so there are uh, LGBT books in every single elementary school in the Madison School District, which is just exciting. And she put some, uh, she just put in another grant to extend that project through the middle of the Cool. Is there a way to access that list through you? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can get that to you. Okay. Or you just go to the library. One of the things that they do right now, it takes forever to get this stuff to happen, and the system is slow, but they're putting little stickers on the back of the books, and also they'll be like a rainbow, so oh. you can see, the, the kids can see which which books are rainbow books, and so that's nice. But the, they're in every one of the, every one of the elementary. Yeah, do you want to say? Well, it also has to do, I guess, with like the you know librarian. My sister's a librarian at elementary school, and she has taken the initiative without like the, a grant like this, but using the school money to provide you know many different types of resources. Right. So I guess it's education on all different levels, and what are you going to do with it? Right. And we have a huge emphasis on literacy. And of course, that's a, books are, I don't know about other people, but that gives you a lot of sense of who you are. Seeing yourself reflected in literature is really important. So. <coughs> oh, here's some other great books. Yep. Uh, Gender Born Generation, not love that photo. It's yeah. so cute. That's a great book. Uh, uh, Psychologist, I think. Uh, this one here is the transgender child. That's the one I was talking about with gender spectrum, and, and that is also a parent, a psychologist, a parent of a transgender youth. We have these that were, uh, are, should be the GLBTQ uh, survival guide should be in all of the middle high school buildings, at least in Madison schools. And it's helpful sometimes if you have staff that you're working with. They can read that as well, and it's also there for, for students too. It's really pretty straightforward. And it goes through, like people were saying earlier, sometimes you're working with middle schoolers and they go to a GSA meeting. I used to do a GSA, and they, I had two kids that after one meeting went home and told their parents they were gay. It was just like, whoa, how did that work for you? And there were, there, sometimes you want to have, help students think through ahead of time some of the kind of impulsive kind of things that they might. And that's a good book for that. And then, I don't know if people are. Yeah, I couldn't find any covers of okay, this book, so I just that, yeah. Yeah, he did a lot of work around uh, uh, GALBT issues in foster care system, and um, so it's, he has a couple of books, and it's a really good resource. Actually, um, the Academy Human Services brought him in earlier this year. Nice. Cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover some first steps when approaching situations, and we're going to talk about safe space considerations. 
um, safety planning, um, which we're already kind of touching about, or touching on assess family and culture, and then build from where the family is at. So just kind of some tips that we have. So the first is just creating safe spaces. So if you have an office or if you have just stuff that you carry on, you recognize that people, especially young people as well as adults, um, look for visual and uh, verbal cues about are you a safe, welcoming, supportive person of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people. So, like, so as far as visual, you know, can you display LGBT materials, whether that's posters? Like, this is my favorite, like, gender non-conforming poster. I said where you can get the link. I don't get any money for recommending them, but <laughs> you can get their stuff for cheap. It's great. So, um, you know, photos. If you have photos in your office or in your space, you know, do you have? Uh, photos of L LGBT family members or friends along with other family members um, and friends. Um, I can tell you, if you don't already know, um, young people are, young uh, LGBT folks are really good at spotting rainbows. Um, and so, you know, if you can put a rainbow on your pin or on a lanyard or like if you have a plan or something like that, just anything that is a visual indicator that you're supportive, that can be helpful. Um, some other things, um, forms of conversation. So, you know, um, if you're working with uh, an organization that has intake forms and stuff like that, that asks about parents, you know, is it parent one, parent two, or is it mom and dad? Uh, or, you know, or when you're talking with young people, do you ask about the adult in the home, or do you ask about mom and dad? Those things communicate different things and different assumptions that you have about the, the child's experience. Um, um, forms also can, or when you're doing intakes or when you're working with youth, I used to work at Browcatch before I went to part of Youth Services in Southern Wisconsin. It was very normal when we were doing intakes to always ask questions about, you know, so if you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, um, as opposed to just making, like, trying to guess, um, just make it standard, it's like, do you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Um, and if they push back, it's like, well, I don't know, and I can't know, and I don't want to make assumptions. And if they push back, I'm like, why do you think I'm gay? Then you can start having a conversation there. Um, so the other thing is, of course, creating safe spaces is challenging of uh, bias language and behavior. Well, I think that's really important is to never ever ignore comments. And then, of course, when I say never ever ignore comments, we're always going to have moments where we miss something or it's like, oh, I want to respond to that and then something else comes up. So we might have to come back to it later. Uh, but what we know is that by ignoring comments or not addressing comments that you heard, the person that might have been the target or the people around them um, understand that you don't challenge that behavior, or you don't you don't care if somebody says something hurtful about not only gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, but people based on race, based on sex, based on national origin, et cetera, et cetera. So, and just um, for dealing with bias language, I'm just going to share just a really simple tool if you haven't heard already. I know some of you have heard it from me already, but uh, people often don't know what to do when they hear uh, bias language. So, I like to teach name and claim it, stop it, walk away, which works like this. You just heard somebody say that's gay. Um, so you say, hey, you just said that's gay. Uh, Pretty simple, or name hey, it. right. So, or it's like, hey, you just said something hurtful. So, so you name it. The next piece is claim it, which is you have to figure out why that's important to you. It could be like, you know what, we don't do that at this agency, or we don't do that at the school. Um, you, uh, you can say, you know what, I have um, friends, like I have friends who are uh, lesbian. Would you make that joke? It's hurtful to them. I have a family member, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have to figure out how to connect it to yourself. Um, and, you know, if you can't think of anything else, you can just say, we don't say that here. Um, stop it is just simply asking them to stop it. It's like, you know what, I don't want to hear it again, or, you know, don't use that word again, come up with something new. And then the walk away, which the walk away point isn't always literally like walking away from the person, but it's not engaging them in an argument, because people, when you challenge them, um, and let me tell you, like, when I try to challenge my friends, particularly around use, like, using uh, racist comments or words, or sexist comments or words, or people really love to use the word, uh, the R word still quite a bit, when I push, like when I challenge them in loving ways, they like to push back. My response is often like, I'm, I'm not having an argument, I'm just saying, you, you said it, it's hurtful, don't say it. So now let's go get uh, pizza or something like that. So anyway, so to recognize that it's not a, like, um, you're not there to have an argument with them. You're right, you made the point, and it's good. Yep? What's the R word? Um, by the R word, I mean either retard or retarded. Oh, thank so, you. Yep. So, Right, so actually it was funny, we were just doing a training um, when people said, we're talking about the S word, and I had to ask them what the S word is, and at the elementary level it was shut up. So I'm like, oh. So, because I'm like, oh, I've been gone in different places and stuff like that. Like, so, right, thank you for asking. So, um, cool. Then also, um, if you want to um, go deeper, um, Zero Difference, which was written by Nancy Goldstein, there's two versions online, one's three pages, one's like 20 pages or so. Um, it's a great way to deepen those conversations where you think about time and place, like do you have a lot of time, do you have a little time, 
if there are a lot of people around, is it fairly private, the conversation that you can have with the person? And then, um, you know, uh, it also gives you questions to ask, such as, like, where did you learn Where did you learn that? Or what do you mean by that when you say that? Or how do you think a gay person would feel if you said that? Or, you know, if somebody makes a person's comment, so how do you think a person of color would feel? So, um, it doesn't always come out perfect. Um, uh, the other holiday, um, I was home with my family, and my mom and my sister were making fun of the way certain ethnic and racial groups, the, the names sound and stuff like that, because I grew up in really white rural Iowa, and anything that sounds different than Pam is really weird and comfortable for them. So, and of course, as they were saying that, I'm like, oh, they're talking about friends and colleagues and students of mine. Um, so I wanted to come up with this really great response, but it was family. And I was sitting on the couch, and really all I wanted to do was be taking a nap at that point. So the, my name to claim it stopped at that point, at that time, was, oh, you guys are horrible. So yeah. I kind of blurted it out and stuff like yeah. that. So, which wasn't exactly the most sophisticated response, but I let them know that I didn't like it, and I spoke up. So they stopped saying it. So it didn't mean that they stopped thinking it, but at least I checked them so that they had to start thinking about their behavior. Yeah? One thing, I was a camp counselor for many years. So Fantastic. I was a safe space, and we were taught, you know, this kind of naming claim it. But um, during a training, at one point, like, what happens if like, this happens? What are you doing? Like, our standard response is that's not hip appropriate. Yep. Uh -huh. not here. But I had a really great um, director tell me once, you know, follow it up, but that's not life appropriate. And try to teach them that even outside of this context, yep. you know, try to extend nice. that past that one space. Yep. Fantastic. So I'm going to try to include that in my repertoire. So no, it's not, not appropriate not here. It's not life appropriate. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I think it's good for the person who's saying it too, because a lot of times, like I know people say things that they don't agree with at all. Like they'll say, "That's gay." Yep. When they don't agree with that, they don't believe in that. That that you know that they're saying it, and it comes out. And then when someone calls them on it, it's like, "Oh yeah, of course they shouldn't yep. be saying that." You know. So I think it is good for both sides because a lot of people. People use it terms that are common, but they don't mean the oh, yeah. mean anything by them, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, in, in, like, I was just doing a training the other day where I used a word that could be considered offensive, like is offensive to people with developmental disabilities, and I was searching for a word, and that was the one that popped into my head. And so, somebody called me, and I'm like, thank you, that's not what yeah. I meant to say, and stuff like that. So, and I owned it, I'm like, yep, I said it. It's like, sorry, I didn't mean to say that, and I realized that wasn't the best word, so. Yeah, yeah. And stuff so, that's working on this anti-harassment uh, stuff in the district, we've been looking at always having two pieces to that. One is to stop the behavior so everybody knows that it's not okay, and the other is to educate. And some of those are two in one. You know, you're able to do that. But to make sure that later on, after you stop it, that you make sure that whoever has said it or whatever understands why. Yeah. It's not just punishment. Do you want me to talk about safety planning? Yeah. Want to talk about I'm safety. Safety. So, so just we've already kind of talked about safety planning and stuff like that, but um, as you're working with these young people who are thinking about coming out, either to family or friends or something like that, something that could be really helpful if they haven't done it already is to actually sit down with them and be like, all right, so what's the worst that can happen? What's the best that can happen? And if the worst happens, what are you going to do? So if your family kicks you out, do you have some place to be? Or are you okay with that? So, um, and then really kind of dig down and press down on them and let them know that if they're pretty confident that the worst case is going to happen, or they want to know what to do if the worst case scenario happens, that maybe it's okay not to be out at this particular point in time, because their like their uh, shelter, their personal safety is actually quite important as well. Um, and then work to figure out where are places that they can be out, or what are some spaces that they can be out. So, so just working with them to do a safety plan, or you know if they have been kicked out, then you have to sit down and do like you work with anybody. It's like. Where are you going to live? Where are you going to sleep? Um, how are you going to um, um, find shelter, et cetera, et cetera? So um, know that um, if you have that chance, because Liz said that you know a student might go to GSA at middle school and they come home that night and be like, I'm gay. <laughs> have not for that at all. So if you get that chance, do that safety plan, do that, that yeah. just getting them to think about what what are the possible results and stuff. So I don't know if you want to add to that. No, just that, that because that's not natural, is it, for youth? They don't aren't. So it's just that helping them work that future do a little thinking about what could happen. Well, is there an adult in the room with the, in the GSA group? Yeah, I was there. I had no idea that this kid Oh, way to go, Liz. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, somebody just reported, and they had a good time, and, you know, into the hour. And so, yeah, sure, of course, now I would always be sure to say something, but I really did make the mistake first, and it wasn't, wasn't pretty. Yeah. You know, and just like any club, you know, lots of things get said things in GSA and stuff like that. And just, busy, because, just, because person, just because a person decides to come out 
out in the course of a GSA doesn't say <coughs> tell anybody that they're going to come out. Right, they're, 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 it might be spontaneous. Right, right. So um, we talked a little bit about this. Um, uh, but, um, making sure to assess the families and or uh, cultural concerns. Yeah. We'll work with folks, um, um, as some folks have already talked about. Um, like, being, like think about what are some dynamics already in the family or already in the community or culture um, that kind of play out and just being cognizant of that. Um, and also uh, stories, how do people talk about gender, how do people talk about sexual orientation and stuff within families, um, c community and culture. Um, so like one, you know, because somebody asked, well, what would you do if you're working with a, a, a family from a different culture? It's like, well, you know, like ask, you know, ask the person, like, how, how do you talk about the issue already? So don't have to be the expert, ask questions. Um, recognize that, then also recognize kinship relationships can be different. So I was talking with um, uh, my colleague Monica, who works with Freedom, um, which works primarily with a, a, a big chunk of the Hmong community, and recognizing that um, there's different, like, with different clans and with different, uh, the relationship, kinship relationships are different. And so being cognizant of that and trying to think about what do I need to know, who do I need to talk about, uh, what are those relationships like? And then we already talked about local resources such as Alianza and people like us, or Alianza Latina, people like us. Um, oh, I thought I saw a hand and it was actually somebody's head. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> it was because I was looking over my glasses and I'm like, that looks like a hand. Oh, never mind, it's a head. All right. Uh, and then the other thing is also just, and I mentioned this earlier, just build, for, for, build from where the family is currently at, not from where you hope they would be. Um, I think it's really important to meet people where they're at because like, if you come and be like, I'm from Madison and we're progressive about gay things and then you <laughs> work with somebody who's like, I don't get this gay thing and stuff like that, you can't start at the, woo, super liberal progressive and stuff like that. So because, like, one, they're not ready for that and then two, you're going to lose them. So um, try to figure out where they're at and build upon some strengths such as like, you know that they're supportive of their child. Great, you've had a past history of being supportive of your child. This might be different for you, but you know how to be supporting your child. Let's try to apply those skills to supporting that child. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, and then build upon those strengths and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, what is, okay, wait, I have to look at the slide. Oh, we're going to ask some questions, but I think because I, think I want to. We'll yeah, yeah, we'll do that at the end. So, um, so, 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 basic suggestions in any setting. Uh, just be aware of language. We've already kind of talked about language, but you know, don't make assumptions about sexual orientation or gender. So, ask people. You know, it's um, it's like, oh, boyfriend or girlfriend, or get in the habit of asking people their preferred gender yeah. pronouns. So, um, if you don't know the person's gender, um, don't want to make an assumption. You know, ask. So it's like, I, you know, do you use male pronouns or do you use female pronouns or whatever? What pronouns do you use? Because um, sometimes you might think a person is uh, male identified and they actually use female pronouns. Like she, her, him, or she, she, her, hers. So um, we do that all the time with students in GSAs. Um, so GSA students are pretty common, uh, very not knowledgeable about preferred gender pronouns or PGPs. Um, again, I've mentioned forms of intake procedures. Be mindful of that. Um, uh, just also be in a mindful <coughs> environment. We talked about creating safe spaces. In school setting, we talked about restorative, not punitive, because um, we know that. Um, uh, punitive responses to behavioral issues often ignores the fact that um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender students, students of color, other uh, minority students, um, they're unfairly, they're disproportionately impacting those students so that they either push out those minority students or um, put consequences uh, or um, a kind of draconian uh, uh, punishments on students that make them unavailable for learning. So, um, um, in school settings, if you're working in a school setting, looking at policies, looking at trainings to make sure that educators are aware of what their responsibility is, know what the laws are, and that they know how to create those spaces. So you can advocate for that. I know a lot of school work, social workers that advocate for that. And if you're working in a school setting without a GSA, suggest a GSA or suggest a support group for students who are either gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, across me, or, or, or allies, or with gay, lesbian parents. Um, in the foster resource setting, um, working to educate families. Um, I, uh, my colleague Monica and I did a training for resource parents about a year ago. We're going to be doing a follow-up one. And um, it was the first time many of them had, um, had to talk about gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender issues uh, about it. And let me tell you, some of those families were right on. They were awesome. And some of them were like, why are we talking about this? So, um, And right now, we don't, as far as I'm aware, and you've corrected me if I'm wrong, there's no way to screen uh, foster resource parents for their attitudes and opinions towards gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender students 
or students of color, um, or youth of color, et cetera, et cetera, and yet they get placed in those families. And so you might have families who think it's wrong, it's a sin, et cetera, for getting students placed with them. So one thing that I would say is that if you can advocate for a change in that system, that would be fan fucking fantastic. I swore, good. I'm glad you caught it first. So, right, yeah. excellent. Yeah? I was just going to say, and um, how effectively yep. creating more spaces for kids who, you know, identify. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not just does the family accept these yep. kids, yep. but having having it out there that this, these families, I mean, I don't mean to make it more marginalized or whatever, but just to have more families that are like, yep. you know, because I don't think there are, are spaces or places that every kid can go. I mean, when you're talking about transgender youth yep. and, and the foster care system or in, yep. in what we work in in group homes, it's, it's there's there's some problem there. I think that that needs to be dealt with. Making it more uh, more the norm. Like okay, this is this is this yep. is the norm, and, and we need to make sure there are places for these kids to be safe and be comfortable and be accepted. Does that make sense? Yep. I'm not trying to be on soapbox. I'm just saying like I don't get on that so We're in a situation right now where it's it's, it's difficult, and we, we want to to be able to um, provide for for this kid, and, yep. and then we're working around licensing and different yep. different things that yep. are coming in and I don't think those things should it shouldn't be an issue. You know what I mean? Yep. And I think that's it. Yeah. But it's good to bring in that up and it would be really helpful to to encourage that in terms of group home training of staff and all. And I do and I do know that once people start to advocate these things it really makes changes. One of our trans uh, parents in the transparent group works in uh, juvenile justice system and so now because of his work um, he, there are spaces when they, when some when people come into the uh, jail that you can access for that are more you know that, that are comfortable for anybody. So that's nice. He made that change to, just because of his advocacy, and so could you, people would come in and talk. Um, uh, we're going to get to a video about juvenile justice yeah. setting. Um, so and Liz had talked. When Liz and I were talking about this, we talked about questioning some systemic bias. We know that there's bias in the system. We know that youth of color, uh, LGBT students, um, there's built-in um, oppression and discrimination within the system. So trying to discriminate at that, and like all you have to do is look at that and look at this proportionality of uh, certain populations in the, the truth and justice system. So and looking at the school to prison pipeline. Um, I'll, you'll be able to look at this. Um, I'll send this out as a PowerPoint if folks want this, but um, look at the school to prison pipeline, which, if people aren't familiar with that term, it's um, recognizing that there's systems in place in school and community that push out and um, push young people into the juvenile justice system or make it more likely that they're going to end up in prison. So, like, particularly if students drop out of school, they have a much greater chance of ending up in prison. So, uh, and so there's lots of system pieces in the system in place um, for LGBT youth, youth of color, et cetera. Um, that um, push them, um, make them more likely to end up in the, the, the prison system. So, and as social workers, you're off. Some of you are going to be interacting with them at various points along the way. So, should we do this, Liz? Yeah. All right. So, woo. Yeah, we'll leave us about 15 minutes so they can be in here. So yep. So, let's see if I have this. Where is it? There it goes. There it goes. All right, video. Let's see if it's still loaded. I'm going to go to about three out of ten. All right. Well, my grandmother raised me from the time I left the hospital until she passed away when I was 11, about to make 12. Moved to Atlanta with my mother. I stayed in trouble in school for not doing my work and not paying attention, talking back to the teachers. I had a fight with this guy in class for going around, you know, telling people I was gay or what I beat him up and we both went to jail, but when they put the handcuffs on me, it was horrible. Once I got in the cell, I just didn't know what to do. I cried, I prayed, I beat on the walls, I rolled on the walls. What could I have done better to avoid that? But in all actuality, I didn't want to avoid it. I felt like I needed you know, to prove myself. I coordinate a project for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth who are in the juvenile justice system. 
The recent study found that around 15% of young people in detention were LGBT. We have a number of youth who come in on charges that stem from school. LGBT youth are more likely to, of course, experience harassment. As a result, either be truant and not go to school, or they may fight back. Kian had difficulty while he was in the detention center with the staff and the other young people that were detained with him. When he was released, he went right back to the same alternative school that he had been attending before he had been arrested. And he ended up just having additional difficulty, which kind of explains the sort of cycle that sometimes will happen with young people going through the system uh, and then right back into the same conditions that sent them there to begin with. A recent study from the Journal of Pediatrics, which is very groundbreaking, found that LGB youth are being targeted for expulsion, suspension, um, and other types of school sanctions, as well as police arrest and detention at higher rates than young people who are not LGB. There are far more young people who are out in public and less closeted about their status. And because of that, I found that there's all kinds of institutional push against that. It becomes a challenge for the adults and the authority figures that have to deal with these young people. There are a number of things that cause LGBT <coughs> youth to be disproportionately represented in juvenile facilities. They are much more often charged with incidents in school. They are much more frequently arrested for sexual behavior that heterosexual youth are not arrested for, or because they are living on the street and they have to resort to crime. First time that I found out about that I'm on the boulevard, I actually came down this street. So that way I knew that, that I could make money that way. I didn't know what else to do. My biological dad was on drugs and so he gave me up when I was like five. And then I stood with my aunt and uncle and they were super abusive and I just I decided um, my freshman year in high school that I didn't want to live there anymore, so I ran away. Family rejection for a teenager, it's a very significant trauma. And then to have to leave home because of that is even more traumatic. Generally, folks say around 40% of homeless youth are LGBT. So knowing that LGBT youth are more likely to be rejected from their family, more likely to be on the streets and homeless, they're gonna be more likely to turn to survival crimes. I didn't have anywhere else to go, so I came out here. It was a tough decision, but it was the, it was the only solution I had to my problem. The first time I did it was on this street. Somebody kept cruising by that was very scary for a 15 year old. So, and it was a really old man, took me to his house, which I had no idea where it was at. And it was the first time I did it. I cried the whole time doing that. The loneliness and the lack of self esteem that stem from the poor relationships that they may have with their parents just leads to uh, more out-of-home placements for these youth. And because of their being out of their family home, it kind of sets them up for problems later in life. I got arrested for a bigger runaway. They put me in the tank for a couple days because I wouldn't tell them my name because I didn't want them to know who I was. So I didn't want them to send me back home. When it was time to see the judge, uh, my aunt had the option to take me back and she said no, she said I don't want him, which I was very grateful for because I, there was no way I wanted to be back with her. LGBT youth are more often detained by the court if a parent doesn't show up to take them home. And so they might have um, a, uh, a misdemeanor like shoplifting charge for which youth would not normally be detained 
but if their parent doesn't pick them up at the courthouse, then they will be held. The mere fact that LGBTQ youth do not have a comfortable place to go home to really changes the whole dynamics of their stay in an out-of-home placement. Because it's not just a temporary placement for them, oftentimes it's just the beginning of uh, their independence or their attempt at independence. The first time I got into the juvenile justice system, I was 12 years old. And around that time, I had just um, began to understand and learn who I was as far as my identity and my gender and sexuality was concerned. And it brought a lot of problems in my home life, especially with my father because he was very abusive. And he was not at all supportive of, you know, the fact that I no longer, you know, was his son, that I was his daughter. At home, I didn't feel like I was, I was loved. At a very young age, I had problems in school, like being picked on and being bullied, and it got so bad to the point where I didn't want to go back to school. When the state found out that I no longer was going to school, they took custody of me from my parents. Anytime you talk about taking a kid out of their home, you necessarily have to admit that you're going to do some harm to them. No, no, maybe you have to do a balancing act and say, okay, well, based on the harm that they're already being exposed to and the potential for a greater harm, I think it's important that the court may say we have to remove the kid from the home. But you have to recognize that you're going to do harm to them. Lily was referred into family court when she was young. She was placed in a group home, and the group home was not at all equipped to uh, work with LGBT young people. Some of the staff, they did not intervene in fights that would happen. There was an individual in the group home that I was at that used to particularly bully me more than everybody else. And so this person used to like physically attack me. I like had to fight them back. I was charged with simple battery. They put me into the juvenile justice system and I became a ward of the state. Once Lily was in the youth prison, she had a really difficult time. She was in an all boys facility. She was experiencing the same things that all youth experience when they're removed from home and placed in a youth prison, only magnified because she identified as transgender. In detention facility, there's a lot of safety concerns for young people who are LGBT, in particular for transgender youth. Um, if, if a transgender girl is placed in a <coughs> boys' detention facility, she's really at very high risk for physical and sexual abuse um, in the facility but at the hands of her peers and also at the hands of facility staff. They recently they heard of a, a, a problem where a transgender girl who was housed in an all-boys detention facility, she was forced to shower with the boys. And when she did, she, she got a ticket, a discipline ticket, for flashing her breasts in the shower. It's unfortunately not uncommon for staff to actually encourage abuse of a youth who's out. The case that the ACLU of Hawaii brought was the first case of its kind ever in the country to challenge the conditions of confinement for children who are or who are perceived to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. We brought the case on behalf of three individual kids. There was Archie, who is a woman who identifies as a lesbian. There is CP, who is a male to female transgender girl. And there was JD, who was a boy that was perceived by staff and other wards to be gay. These kids were subjected to unchecked harassment, relentless abuse and discrimination, not only by the other wards, but by the staff themselves. They would talk to these young kids about their religious views and telling these kids that being gay was wrong and a sin and it was against God and that they were going to hell. And this is, you know, talking to kids who are religious themselves. We got a very frantic call from a public defender 
that one of her kids, her clients, had been subjected to very serious physical assaults. This was a kid who had other wards pantomiming anal rape. He had semen rubbed in his face. And then when he wrote a complaint, the response was that they were going to put him in isolation and they kept him isolated for six days. And never once did they address with any of the wards or the staff who had seen this happening that this was inappropriate behavior. There was one particular officer who, when he was testifying, he was talking about uh, one of the girls, RG, and he had been asked if she had been discriminated against or harassed as far as he had seen. And his answer with a completely straight face, and I think really genuinely, was, no, no, I mean, we have to get on her for that butchy action that goes on. But no, 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 she hasn't been discriminated against or harassed. And I think it was also the, I think it was like that aha moment for everybody in the courtroom, including the judge. Ultimately, what Judge Seabright ruled was that the state of Hawaii had failed its constitutional duty by failing to have any policies or procedures whatsoever that were addressed towards eliminating discrimination, abuse, and harassment. The state of Hawaii was the first state to have a policy specifically directed towards the treatment of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender kids. And we were fortunate because we have been able to serve as a role model for other states who started to look at their own juvenile justice populations and to ask whether this sort of rampant abuse was happening in their state. Every child needs love. Every child needs nurturance. Every child needs to feel wanted. And when an LGBTQ youth doesn't feel that, um, ends up dropping out of school, feeling suicidal, um, getting arrested and then finding themselves in the criminal justice system. Uh, it, it's just a consequence of not being treated like a human being. This is not about special treatment or special rights. It's about equal treatment. It's about ensuring that LGBT young people are safe. We have been working with a number of facilities, some of the short-term detention centers, may actually be passing an LGBT policy in the future. We're hopeful for that. When there is some kind of failure happening in the community, when their parents are not doing the job, when the school system is not doing the job, it is our obligation to care for these children. I wanted somebody to love me, so to speak, and, and I wasn't going to get that from them. I am who I am, regardless of orientation, race, or anything else. As a person and a human being, I have the right to date who I want. I have the right to do anything with my mind, my body, and my sexual orientation. It's, it, it, it's an issue that people need to be trained about. People need to understand that, you know, we're people too. Probably didn't give you enough time to talk about all these in great detail, although some of them you might have gone over. But what were kind of some of the either solutions that you came up with or some questions that you came up with in regards to your particular things? Because there's about 10 different scenarios in the room yeah. right now. So, so yeah. give us a little of your scenario. Uh, we had the scenario of a transgender youth coming into a juvenile facility mm -hmm. um, and which unit would you place them on. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the both the aspect of asking them how they identify, but also about the safety of, so if there's a transgender female to male, mm -hmm. and then putting them on the male unit might be really unsafe for them, even though they identify as being male. So we also talked about using the question, where, where would you feel the safest? Um, and letting them kind of have some input so that it's not like you making the decision for them, but they can say, I identify as male, but I really think I would feel safest with the females or with the males or so that it's kind of because safety is a huge issue in the juvenile system. Did other people have that? Oh, go ahead. I just have a question with the juvenile system. I'm not too knowledgeable on it. I know it's very systematic, but like do people have like choices? Like is with if you were a transgender person, is there any choice? No. Well. Yeah. I don't you know, I don't know how with people I don't think there is. I think it has to do with like this particular person I said who puts in place a policy where that, that if you're aware then you mm -hmm. can do safety planning. That could be for any reason. You could imagine you get a kid in who's been in a, 
their families are in different gangs or something. There's all sorts of safety considerations, so I'm sure there's a way to. But it's just like a checklist, like, oh, biologically, we think you're a male, so you go in here without having any, is it still like that? I just, I don't know. I think the forms, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Actually, I work for Dane County Foster Care, and we're dealing with an issue like this, so we are looking at those needs. Oh, okay. that would be appropriate match. Fantastic. So we, Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. And even in the school system now, we're lucky we can make changes in there pretty easily. People don't like what their box is that's checked, but mm -hmm. because of different funding things, they have to check a box. Yeah, yeah you need to put, well. Oh. I just had a, we have a classmate who we won't tell you about this herself, but she's doing great things in Jefferson County. She um, is changed for the juvenile justice and foster care. She's changing the forms to be spectrum. Um, and she, and might have a, she might have a brand or something. Yeah, she might. <laughs> she might be going like this right now. And doing yeah. training for foster families yeah. to include not only race but also gender identity yeah. acceptance. Fantastic. So send us that. Would you? Yeah. Would you that I would love to see yeah. it. I have, yeah. yeah. Now we've been engaged in public investment. That's good. So, uh, so cool. Did anybody else that had that scenario have anything they want to add to that? Your silence tells me to move on to a different scenario. So you know, what were some other scenarios that people worked on that you either had questions or not sure, or you thought that you came up with a great kind of first steps, first considerations and intervention? So, or you're just like, I don't know. So yeah. I actually have a real scenario. Great. Okay. Let's like great. Um, let's do it. I'm a social worker, I do in-home social work, and um, I have a student that is 14 years old, and he has been having behavioral problems throughout his whole school age life. Um, he completely loses it and attacks another kid if he gets called gay. He's able to walk away from other situations, but gay is the trigger for him. Um, his teachers describe him as effeminate. Um, I do in-home work with him. I mean, I'm like, maybe, I don't know. It seems I wouldn't use that word to describe him. Um, he's African-American. His um, father is not in the picture, although his mother describes his father as saying, maybe he's not the boy that he, his father wants him to be. So, you know, in the last couple of weeks, his behavior at school has kind of escalated more fights. And I'm just actually looking for ideas about um, kind of opening that door to ask about his sexual orientation, what he, where he's at, and not losing him. I'm, not, I'm afraid I think very easily I can lose him. So I, I, I thought that you said something earlier about just you know like having rainbow on my bookcase or whatever. Or I'm not quite sure. I just don't know how to gently open a window for discussion. And I thought I would just put it out there. Okay. So maybe we could say some stuff if people have suggestions. Yeah. Maybe even ask directly. How would you feel if I asked you about this? <coughs> I mean, maybe a roundabout way to do it would be to have a conversation with him about the fact that he's getting into fights and to talk to him about why he feels that gay is such a trigger. And maybe while explaining that to you, he would like open up more about how he's feeling, and maybe he wouldn't. But I think it would be hard to like ask him directly because if gay is a trigger for him, I feel like that could really upset him and like damage your relationship. It definitely remind him that you're a therapist and you can't talk to anyone else about it without his permission. Yeah, right here. I wanted to say, you know, um, I talk to kids about a lot of things, and you're not going to surprise me at all. And so, if you want to talk to me about anything, I'm willing to listen and we can try to work through things. Also, for that, a team meeting with the school and mom and you would be good. Um, I'm essentially a child, too. I think children should be involved, but if that's um, something that's going on, that might be good. Mm -hmm. What kind of support? No, I, all I can say is I was going to go that same place about just ask, uh, just um, exploring a little bit about what about that word. You know, it seems like you just noticed the panel and can talk a little bit about because that has different meanings and different places and what kinds of things does. Um, we 
associate with that. But I would be, I would get it out there pretty clearly in, in stuff that's around you or in so many ways that one of those signs says it's okay to talk to me about anything. Or just so that you're clear that you're a safe person. That's important. And, and realize that you might never talk to them. You just might not. What do you think about self-disclosure? Because I'm lesbian. Maybe I'm not out with his family. Mm -hmm. and, this, and I have a good relationship with them. I mean, I, I don't think I'll lose them. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't consider this with most of the families I work with. But what would you, what's that? I would definitely start with the other stuff first because I think that you don't want to put something else in the way between you and him just where it is right now and obviously that's pretty hot topic. So, um, you know, you get some way to get permission to talk that it's okay that you, I, I, you wouldn't, I don't think there would be anything necessarily wrong with having a few photos up or something. I think the question is asked, but I would just be a little, I just think it's like, because by coming out, it might be saying, I'm coming out to you because I want you to come out to me, or yeah. something like that. Right, so. I just know, at, or I might, I bet that I could lose a man. Yes. I could definitely lose the whole family at that point. Yes. I'm very, I'm very like, cautious about that. And I think there's, I've heard different things like about, like, you know, sometimes kids need an ally, and, and they, need, they need a gay ally. And so, like, That's a good question, you know, because that would challenge that, whatever that word's bringing up to. You know, that word, for example, yeah. do you know anybody who is? Or, oh, you know, yes. just figure that out a little bit more. Just explore. Like it's nice you? when you've got a third point, you know, it's not about you, it's about this thing over here, and we can talk about this, and mm -hmm. it takes some of the heat off. Thank you. Yeah. Same you. Oh yeah, that's what I was gonna say with the, the self-disclosure thing. The situation could be really useful as long as you like let it happen in like a really casual and like natural way. Like maybe you had a picture up with a partner, or maybe he was like asking you about the weekend, and you're like, yeah. oh, well, me and my partner went here, just like let it come up really casual and not like bring it up in like a serious conversation. Like I want you to know I'm gay. Okay. Yeah. Then, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I'm a gay. Are you okay with that? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, right, right, right. So, kind of think it's all about you, but yeah, so kind of the casual. And not be like, you know, saying it, then be like, so how do you feel about that? But it's just simply like put it out there yeah. so that kind of built, dropping those seeds that you're an okay person to talk to about these things. Mm -hmm. so, or, you know, if you have a sister who's okay, gay or a uh, friend who's gay and stuff like that. So, cool. Hey, thanks to everybody for being so Yeah, I know Audrey said that if you haven't worked on your evaluations yet, feel free to just drop them on.